Hi, my name is Alex Dolphin and welcome back to another episode of Ex-Ante. Today we're going to discuss the case of Bloor v. Falstaff Brewing. This case was heard in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in the year of 1979. Let's go ahead and jump into the facts of the case. Bloor was a trustee of a line of beer. Um, this beer had been licensed um, proprietarily to a company called IFC. Then IFC sold that license, uh, transferred it to a company called Falstaff, which is the defendant in this case. So Bloor um, had a couple of clauses in his contract when he licensed this beer. Uh, one was the best efforts uh, clause, and then the other was um, a royalty clause, um, which stated that if the company failed to distribute the beer, then he would be entitled to 1.1 million, right? So um, Bloor basically gave them, gave Falstaff the license to sell this beer. Um, Falstaff was meant to use its best efforts to sell this beer. Um, and if they didn't, then it would be a, a breach. And then secondarily, they were um, meant to distribute this beer. And if they failed to distribute this beer, um, then it would be another form of the breach. And, um, and Bloor would be able to recover $1.1 million plus the unpaid uh, royalties. So there's two important clauses in the contract at play here. Um, the facts of the case are that uh, the market kind of turned after Falstaff had acquired this Ballantine beer, which I've put a picture up next to me of. Um, it, it was selling this beer in the Northeast and in some other regions, um, but effectively Falstaff wasn't doing a very good job of selling this beer. Um, there weren't a whole bunch of, there wasn't a bunch of volume being moved. Um, Bloor was frustrated. He's like, you know, these guys are break, breaching the contract. They're not using their best efforts to sell. So he pointed to a few facts, uh, one that a new uh, chairman of the company had come in, um, Mr. Kalmanovitz. Uh, he had 40 years of brewing experience and kind of like a consultant of sorts. He was meant to turn around um, the company. Um, and so in that process, uh, he began to use a new distributor. This distributor that was meant to distribute the Ballantine beer also had their own line of beer, right? So there was a, a competing um, interest there. Um, they had an offer from Guinness to help you know, promote the Ballantine beer, but they didn't accept it. Um, they closed a depot where a lot of Ballantine beer was distributed um, and they didn't treat the Ballantine beer in the same way that they did their other lines of beer. So a few arguments uh, and facts that uh, the plaintiff has saying that, hey, you didn't treat my beer equally. You didn't use good faith to try and sell this. And ultimately, the court is sympathetic to the plaintiff's argument and rules that the, the Falstaff Brewing Company didn't use its best efforts to sell the beer. Um, so what the court decides is they're going to use a peg of another beer that was, you know, comparative to uh, Ballantine beer and see how many units of, of that beer were sold and then calculate a royalty based upon that uh, to reward damages to Mr. Bloor. So Bloor says he's not finished, though. He wants the 1.1 million, right, because they failed to distribute his beer. The court says, well, they didn't really fail to distribute the beer. Um, they still were distributing the beer just not in their best efforts. So you might win on best efforts, but you're not gonna win on this failure to distribute. So they don't grant him that $1.1 million uh, in damages. So um, that's the case, uh, hinging mostly on best efforts and what a best efforts look like. And the court says that best efforts don't look like, you know, you, have, you don't have to bankrupt yourself um, to sell Ballantine beer, but you can't cut it out or treat other beers better, right? That doesn't mean you're using your best efforts to sell Ballantine beer. I mean, for that reason, the court rules in favor of the plaintiff. So just the ex ante discussion of this case. Um, it's interesting when you think of, you know, good faith, uh, your best efforts. Um, it's so kind of, it really just inserts an ex post prong for the court to use, right? The court will just look at the facts and say, well, these are the best efforts. No, those weren't the best efforts. But it just is this standard that the court is allowed to use, which then it can rule and use its discretion to say, yeah, best efforts, not best efforts. Um, it might be a little bit more efficient um, if there was an actual standard of what best efforts looked like. I and mean, it might be difficult to codify, but if it was out there, there would likely be a lot less lawsuits brought towards the court trying to understand what best efforts really means, what good faith really means, right? Because if the court is left to define those vague terms, it's necessary that a lot of litigation is going to come to the court to define those terms, right? But if those terms were actually defined in a concrete way that could be applied across all businesses, then you would have parties more often than not settle, right? Because then they would be able to look into um, look into the case ahead of time and see, hey, well, you know, it's pretty obvious that we're going to lose because the best efforts statute, whatever that might look like, 
um, we didn't live up to that, right? And or oh well, it's, it's quite likely that we're going to win, so we'll 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 stay and we're going to go to court, um, and you know we're not going to settle this out. Um, if you guys want to settle, hey, look, this is the statute, right? This is this this is the actual rule, um, rather than this broad standard that allows judicial discretion, which is good, uh, because it does definitely uh, ensure justice at, with the parties that are you know uh, before the court, but it might actually increase the amount of litigation in the future. So that's something I wanted to discuss with the standard of good faith, best efforts being so broad um, and hard for parties to predict what that might look like in the court uh, in practice. So thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.